Hey, good morning, City Church. As Ashley said, my name is Zach Meredith. I serve as the groups director here. Uh, thanks for joining us this morning as we are con- con- going to continue in our study of the book of Acts where we've been going verse by verse, chapter by chapter, diving into this awesome book. And today we're going to be looking at a lot of scripture. We're going to be looking at all of chapter 6 and 54 verses in chapter 7. I was very tempted to just go, hey, let's read it, say amen, and go to lunch, but I'm not going to do that because I like my job. Um, but uh, uh, one common theme that, that we have seen throughout the book of Acts and one common theme that we are going to continue to see is the church grow, more people come to know and believe in Jesus, the gospel being spread, and uh, some conflict happening that we're going to see the early church uh, resolve uh, in a godly way. So let's pray real quick, and then we're going to dive in. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, be with us right now as we dive into your word. We thank you for your word. God, I pray that we uh, would bring glory to you through reading this, and we would grow to know and to love you more. It's in your name I pray. Amen. So much like if you remember in chapter 5, we're going to see Luke, who, the, who is the author of Acts, kind of peel back the curtain a little bit and give us an inside glimpse into the interworkings of this early church. And um, he's going to show us some blessings. He's going to show us some challenges of a church that is growing very, very, very fast. So let's start reading together in Acts chapter 6, verse 1. It said, in those days, here we go, right here, as the disciples were increasing in number, there arose a complaint by the Hellenistic Jews against the Hebraic Jews that their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution. So the 12 summoned the whole company of disciples and said, it would not be right for us to give up preaching the word of God to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and wisdom, whom we can appoint to this duty, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And this proposal, it pleased the whole company. So they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and Philip and Prochorus. This is when you're reading in your head, you're just like, no, 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 no. Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a convert from Antioch. And they had them stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. And I think after reading that, we can really pull out a very practical truth about just the church in general, right? That gospel growth, uh, church growth, numerical growth, it brings blessings. It brings some problems, and it brings opportunities for a solution. So if we look at the very first part of chapter 6, verse 1, what's the good news? Well, that the church is growing, right? The disciples are growing in number. And what's the bad news? That people are being overlooked. Their needs are being overlooked. There is complaints coming from within the church. So Luke shows us this issue that arose during the very early growth of the church. It's growing at such a rapid pace that there was a group of widows that were being overlooked, that were being neglected in the daily distribution. And this is a big issue, right? This is a big issue. Members of The church were depending on the church for daily needs, and they weren't getting that. I mean, if we think back in like chapters 2, 3, and 4, we talked about people who had a lot selling their things, taking that money, putting it at the apostles' feet, and saying, give to those in the church who need it. Well, that's not happening here. We can see here that the early church had dealt with some uh, human limitations, and I think I'm speaking for myself in this, I think it's easy to look at this church in Acts, the beginning of the church, specifically like in the end of chapter two, and almost romanticize the early church and paint this picture of this perfect harmony. They're going to different houses. They're breaking bread. No one has any needs. John's taking out a guitar and singing Kumbaya for two hours. It's awesome. It's this image of perfection and harmony. Well, we know that's not the case. We know it's not the case, right? Number one, we read about the, their daily persecution. They're being thrown in jail. They're being threatened. Number two, we read a story a couple weeks ago about this husband and wife duo, Ananias and Sapphira, who were in the midst of the church trying to deceive the church and its leaders. And then right here, we see a human limitation of the early church, that they could not see and fulfill everyone's needs. So is this a perfect church? 
No, absolutely not. No. Is it a church that had a lot of wins in this gospel-centered growth that did great work in their community? Yes. They had wins and they had failures, and a big failure is pointed out right here. Failure to attend to the needs of this group of widows. And we see the care of orphans and widows as this common theme that the church has to be about. It, they, they were failing to live out James 1.27. It says, pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress. And I think, just a sidebar real quick, I think it's also important to point out that not all failures of a church or in a church are a result of sin. Right? Did the apostles hate widows? Did they see them coming in the daily distribution and say, oh, no, we don't have anything, sorry? No, of course not. Did they have human limitations? Were they a small number of guys in a church of tens of thousands that struggled to maintain the needs of every member? Well, yeah, of course. They were made aware of a big oversight, and they seek to fix it. So what do they do? They instruct the church. They bring the church together. They instruct them, select qualified leaders with good reputations full of spirit and wisdom. So they, they want men respected by others who bear fruit of the spirit, men filled with godly wisdom to help take care and serve the needs of the church. And when I first read that verse where it says... Uh, it would not be right for us to give up the preaching of the word to wait on tables. I was like, wow, it's kind of a cocky thing to say. That's kind of bold. But what they're saying here is, hey, we're committed to the biblical priorities of praying and of teaching. They're not on vacation while people are doing serving and doing work in the church. No, they're teaching, preaching in homes, marketplaces, synagogues. They're being arrested. Like all day, every day they're doing this because they understood that the spread of the gospel, it's driven by prayer and by teaching, by telling. And the apostles understood the importance of this. They knew that any departure from doing that, the church would crumble. So they raised up and they commissioned these men of the church to come alongside under the authority of the apostles and to serve and to serve the needs and the members of the church and, and financially, physically, labor, and some point to this as the formation of the role of what we call a deacon in the church. And while the official term deacon is not used in the book of Acts, other books in the New Testament use the word deacon, and they point to the same qualifications. Like off the top of my head, Titus, 2 Timothy, they use the word deacon, and it's the same thing, right? Sound faith, good Christian reputation, active involvement, personal integrity, maturity, holiness, and I, I say these things and list these characteristics because we have a group of deacons here at City Church, and they're awesome. They're a phenomenal group of godly men who seek to serve the members here at church, and we're very, very thankful for them, and, and, and we appreciate them, but we see that kind of start right here in the book of Acts. It's kind of cool, and then Luke is going to transition after this to a very encouraging and powerful and somewhat sad story about one of these selected deacons named Stephen. But first, he kind of puts this buffer uh, verse, verse 7, in between. And I think that this verse is really cool. I think there's two really cool nuggets in this verse. Look with me in verse 7. It says, So the word of God spread, and the disciples in Jerusalem grew, increased greatly in number, and a large group of priests became obedient to the faith. Two things here. Number one, the church is still growing at a rapid pace. It says it in verse one, it kind of bookends this section, right? Verse one, the church is growing, disciples are being made, and then a problem that could blow up the church. Then it, it's handled in a godly way by godly men. And then what's the solution? Well, men are, 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 are people are still coming to know the Lord. And I think this is a, a more of a, a larger theme in the book of Acts, the continued attempts to blow out and to suppress the spread of this gospel message only causes it to go further. And I was talking with some, some guys um, at the church this past week just about this. And this mental image that came in my head of like, well, 
I think I was in like middle school or high school probably, hopefully not high school, maybe elementary. And uh, I wanted to see how fast the uh, napkin would burn if I lit it on fire. So I got a paper plate, <laughs> I hope I wasn't in high school, got a paper plate, got a couple napkins, lit the corner on fire, and it, it lights very fast. And I was very overwhelmed all of a sudden by this flame, and so what did I do to try to suppress the flame? I went, Pfft. I blew it. What does that do? It spread. It started going all over the counter and the floor. I don't think my parents know to this day. They will find out because they will probably watch this. The house didn't burn down. It's all right. But that's this mental image I have in my head every time we read in the book of Acts of this trying to suppress the spread of the gospel. What does it do? What man meant for evil, God meant for good. What man meant to snuff this out, God has said, no, no, no. What you're doing is actually helping spread my name. And the second really cool thing in chapter 7, it says a large group of priests became obedient to the faith. I can't help but think when I read that, are these some of the same priests that we read about a few weeks ago that put Peter and John on trial, that threw them in jail, that threatened their way to suppressing the gospel? We don't know for certain we really don't. It doesn't tell us, but I believe it's a real possibility. These men who once held such a firm stance on Jesus not being God's son have heard and now have been gripped by the gospel and given life in that same Jesus. It's just incredible little nugget that we're given here that even the most ardent adversaries of the gospel can be bought, brought to repentance and life in Christ. We'll see it again, I think, in chapter 9 in a few weeks with Saul, someone whose life goal is to persecute the church, becomes the number one missionary throughout the book of Acts and the New Testament. And we can look at this and thank God for his mercy in that. So let's turn to Stephen now. We're going to be chapter 6, verse 8. Now Stephen, remember he was one of the, the chosen men, one of the deacons that we just read about, was full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. But opposition arose, however, surprise, surprise, here we go, for some members of the Freedmen Synagogue composed of both Cyrenians and Alexandrians and some from Cilicia and Asia, they began to argue with Stephen. They were unable to stand up against the wisdom and the spirit by whom he was speaking. Once again, we see the role of the Holy Spirit at work in the life of the believers. And so what did they do in, chapter, in verse 11? Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, we heard him speak in blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up people, the elders and the scribes. And so they came and they seized him and they took him to the Sanhedrin. They also presented false witnesses who said, this man never stops speaking against this holy place in the law. For we heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs that Moses handed down to us. And all who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at him, and they saw his face was like the face of an angel. Chapter 7, verse 1, are these things true? The high priest asked. Brothers and fathers, he replied, listen, are these things true? Are you and are, is Jesus against the temple, God's place? Are you against the law of Moses? He's accused of these things, but he's given a chance to defend himself. And he does a really strange thing. I think if I was him, I'd, be, I'd clap back and be like, I never said those things. I don't even know those people. They have no clue. I'm sur right? We we're surrounded by this angry group of religious elites, the Sanhedrin. But he doesn't say yes. He doesn't say no. He does kind of a strange thing. He tells a story. He preaches a sermon. It's the majority of the, uh, chapter 7. It's the longest sermon recorded in Acts. And what he preaches on is a condensed history of Israel. He starts with like the celebrity list of Old Testament figures. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Joshua, David, Solomon, and he ends with the building of the temple in Jerusalem. At first sight, 
I mean, for a guy that's been charged with speaking against the law and Moses and God's temple, it kind of looks like a bad defense. It tells a story. But what's incredible is that we'll, we're going to see this as we unpack this. His defense speech in which he tells the history of the Old Testament actually proves the opposite of what he's accused of. That it is Israel, right, as a people, they've stiffened their necks against God. They've resisted the Holy Spirit. They persecuted the prophets of God. They tried to kill Jesus, the Son of God. And now they're sitting there about to kill a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. And he flips it on him and says, no, you're the ones that need to give an account, not me. So Stephen, and this is where we're going to summarize a lot of it because it's like 54 verses. So Stephen, he starts his defense and he zooms in and hones in on the story of Abraham at the very beginning. God gives Abraham clear instruction. Abraham follows it kind of, like halfway. Lacks in fully following God's command. And so God, he, Stephen highlights God doing two things to Abraham. Number one, giving him grace. And number two, giving, giving him a kick in the pants to go. Then he continues on and then he zooms in on the story of Joseph. And how the leaders at the time, his brothers, were resistant to Joseph's calling as the leader. So what do they do? They lure him into a field. They throw him into slavery. They tell his dad that he died. But we see throughout the story, God is sovereign and protects his people and is rich in mercy and uses what man meant for evil for good. And he saves Israel, the brothers, the family from starvation. How does he do it? He does it by using Joseph. And his elevated status in Israel. If you've never read that story, it's an amazing story. It tells a lot about God's character. It's Genesis like 38 through 50. I'd love for you to go back and read that. And then finally, Stephen mentions some more people, and then he zooms in for the last time on Moses. And how despite clear signs of protection and deliverance from Egypt, the Israelites continue over and over and over to forget the goodness of God, and they throw him aside and strive to worship created things over the creator. We're going to jump in to Stephen's sermon right here in verse 39. This is in the middle of his sermon. Our ancestors were unwilling to obey him. So the Israelites unwilling right here, he's talking about to obey Moses. Moses was appointed by God, so like translated property or whatever, unwilling to obey God. Instead, they pushed him aside, and in their hearts, they turned back to Egypt, where they were slaves. It says, they told Aaron, hey, make us gods who will go before us. As for this Moses, who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what's even happened to him. They even made a calf in those days and offered sacrifices to the idol. They were celebrating what their hands had made. So God turned away and gave them up to worship to the stars in the heaven as it is written in the book of the prophets. House of Israel, did you bring me offerings and sacrifices for 40 years in the wilderness? No. You took up the tent of Moloch and the star of your God, Raphan, the images that you made to worship. So I will send you into exile beyond Babylon. If you're familiar with any of the Old Testament history of the Israelites, you know that they continued, despite deliverance over and over and over again, continued to turn from God to idols. And although we see over and over, we see God give grace and forgiveness, and we know that even now he gives those things freely and abundantly, we praise him for that. It says right here that he gives them up to worship what they want. He punishes his people for their, dis, for their continued disobedience. And we know that they get sent to exile in Babylon. God doesn't abandon his people. He never will. And he delivers them out of exile. It's a really cool picture painted there. But we can read that and say, hey, God's grace, God's forgiveness in which he gives freely is not to be abused. It's not to be tested. And this testing of God and his grace and forgiveness, it's not this foreign idea or foreign practice that we only read about in the Old Testament. 
May we do it today. Look at the same thing in the New Testament in Romans 1. It describes the same thing, but in a different context. It says, for they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or show gratitude. Instead, their thinking became worthless and their senseless hearts were darkened. They claimed to be wise, but they became fools. They exchanged the glory of an immortal God for images, images resembling mortal man, birds, four-footed animals, reptiles, exchanging the immortal God for things, for career, for relationships, for money. Therefore, because of that, God delivered them over to the desires of their hearts, to sexual impurity, so that their bodies were degraded among themselves. They exchanged, so they had the truth of God, and they exchanged it for a lie. They worshiped and served what had been created instead of the creator who is praised forever. It says they exchanged, they had it, the truth of God, and they exchanged it. They threw it away, and they believed the lie. They worship created things instead of the creator. I think that's so relevant today even. This type of worship of things and false truths. We can't let that happen on our watch here at City Church. How do we do that? Well, we stand firm in the truth of Scripture and God's promises and continue to seek him. And Stephen, and then we see it in Romans, but Stephen... In his sermon, he points out this continuous rebellion, and then look how Stephen ends his sermon. Look at his final rebuttal. He tells this oral history of the Israelites, and then he turns, and he's surrounded right now. He turns, and he's looking at everyone straight in their eyes in the Sanhedrin, and we know that they're looking directly at him, right? He says they're all staring intently at him, and he says, verse 51, You stiff-necked people (laughs) with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you're always resisting the Holy Spirit, just as your ancestors did. You did also. I just told you about that. I think this is some sarcasm right here. I mean, which of the prophets did your ancestors not persecute? So they even killed those who foretold the coming of the righteous one. Right? The righteous one whose betrayers and murderers you have become. It says you received the law under the direction of angels, like directly, yet you have not kept it. One of like the key words, if you have to pick key words in the book of Acts so far, has been boldness, right? <laughs> this fits the bill. I mean, he calls them stiff-necked, that they resist the Holy Spirit, that they're persecutors, betrayers, murderers, not keepers of the law. And he gives them proof of this. He shows them the history of their own people. And you're just like those guys. What he's effectively saying here is he's saying, you claim to know God. You claim to know him better than anyone. You're the religious elite. You claim to have mastered your knowledge of the Old Testament scriptures. You claim to know all the prophecies of Jesus' coming Messiah. But you don't. He says, you don't know him. You know about God, right? You know about the facts. You know about the coming of the Messiah, but you don't know God personally. He says, you want proof? He said, three months ago, you tried to kill him. He came. He's right here. You know the prophecies. You see him, you tried to kill him. It didn't work, right? You tried to, though. You're not like saying if it was a snake, it would have bit you. They would have got bit. He was right there. These group of religious elites who claimed to know God didn't. And when Stephen calls them out on it, you think I'm against Jesus and the law of Moses and the temple? You think I'm the one against them? No, you are. When he says this, they do something illegal. There's a spoiler alert to next week, I guess, but they pick up rocks right then and there and they throw them at him. They stone him to death. And we'll unpack that more next week. But we see Stephen just blatantly call out the hypocrisy. He's not the only one who did it, right? Jesus did it as well in his ministry. Look at John 5. 
He's talking to the Pharisees, these same type of people, the religious elite. He says, John 5, says, the Father, this is Jesus talking, the Father who sent me has himself testified about me. It's the Old Testament. You have not heard his voice at any time. You haven't seen his form. It says, you don't have his word residing in you because you don't believe the one he sent. It says, you pour over the scriptures because you think you have eternal life in them, in this. Yet this testifies about me. It says, you're not willing to come to me so that you may have life. It's the same idea. They know facts, but they don't know, they know about Jesus, about God, but they don't know him personally. And I think that this section of scripture opens our eyes to this difference that Stephen says in Acts in chapter 7 and Jesus we just read about in John. It points to, and I think it gives us a good question that we can leave from here and think about and chew on and reflect on, is that do you know Jesus? Do you know our God or do you just know about him? Do you know him? personally or do you just know about him all right do we just know like the facts the stories the rituals what to say when to say it you don't know god or know jesus you know about but you don't know you have a relationship with him spend time with him in his word talk to him do you love him do you know the character of god and i think it's very very important for us to think about that because there's a massive, massive difference between knowing and knowing about, right? We could could leave here, go to Books A Million, or we could even go on Wikipedia if we wanted to, get a biography on Elon Musk or someone like that. Know the birthday, know where he was born, know where he went to school, know what favorite ice cream flavor he likes, know where he grew up. We can know the facts about him, but it will be a completely different ballgame if you knew him personally. I mean, I don't talk with him. I don't spend time with him. I don't dwell with him. I may know facts about him. I think there's a huge difference, and know there's a huge difference between knowing about and knowing personally. And knowing Jesus personally leads to personal change. And that's how Stephen was so easily able to call him out so you don't know Jesus because you haven't changed, right? I just told you like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of history of the same thing, and you're doing that. You don't know Jesus. You haven't changed. Knowing and believing in the gospel of Jesus changes you, right? The death of a perfect Jesus in our place, the sacrificial lamb in your place on the cross, dying the death that we deserve because of sin, how do we respond to that? Well, the, God, the, the Bible's clear on that. We confess Jesus as Lord, believe that God raised him from the, day, the, the dead, and he is the Son of God. It says we'll be forgiven. What does that mean? It means we're seen white as snow in, in front of a holy God, and we can spend eternity in heaven worshiping him. Believing and trusting in that gospel right there, that leads to life change. How could it not? It leads to personally changing in many aspects. I have four that I just want to highlight. How knowing Jesus changes us. Number one, knowing Jesus leads to life change, right? Literally a life dead in sin, destined for hell for eternity. Knowing Jesus leads to life, alive in Christ worshiping God in heaven for eternity. It's huge. Number two, knowing Jesus leads to mission change from a mission of self-satisfaction. Everything we do in life is for us to a life on the great commission. Now we just tell. That's our goal is to tell. Number three, knowing Jesus leads to a priority change from glorifying self to now glorifying God. That's our main mission as believers. Number four, knowing Jesus leads to a worship change. 
right? Worshiping things, worshiping approval, worshiping people, worshiping relationships, to now having a complete and total worship of God in all we do. So I pray that we read this as we continue to read through Acts and be a church, but more specifically Christians who strive to know Jesus personally, who know Jesus intimately, because then in turn that is going to unify us as we go on mission, as we read scripture, active in prayer, active in community. We're doing this together on mission. You probably see it out, out in the lobby or signs around or on social media, like we are being for the gospel first and foremost, right? We're also for our city. And we're actively sending people to the world. So let's pray and then we're gonna sing another song together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for uh, Stephen and his example that you have given us. God, we pray that we would not be like uh, the people that we read about that claim to know you but only know about you. God, we pray that we would know you personally. Thank you for giving us that opportunity to know you personally through Jesus. Pray that as we do that, there would be change, there would be life change, and that we would go on mission. God, once again, I pray for our missionaries in London who are hopefully there and, and those leaving for Berlin. I pray that you would use them to plant seeds that only you can grow and that there will be long-lasting effects of those missionaries that are being sent. We pray all this in your name. Amen.